Hi, everyone. It's Derek and Jason here. With the Grammys coming up, we're doing Music Month here on The Last Days Podcast. Each week, we're going to cover the death of a musician who has profoundly impacted the music industry. And Derek has an exciting announcement to make about a new podcast we're doing. That's right. We're launching the TMZ Swift Tea Podcast. It's hosted by Melanie Miller and Christina Cavallari. It's got all the exclusive news, insider info, and updates on everything in the world of Taylor Swift. It starts on February 6th, so go ahead and give it a listen. Now let's get into this week's episode. Listen to me, I'm gonna set you free, sir. He ain't gonna break your heart again, sir. Go through the worst to reach the ecstasy. When your imagination's on pretend, sir. I never thought that it would feel this way. You never taught me how to heal the pain. I wish you caught me on a different day. When it was easier to be happy, just a little taste, and you know she got you. By the time Mac Miller was 25 years old, he'd had a number one album and a series of platinum and gold singles. He'd collaborated with Pharrell Williams and Anderson Pack, and toured with Kendrick Lamar and Wiz Khalifa, and Drake called him one of the most gifted young artists in rap. He'd launched his own record label, and his last three albums, Good, AM, The Divine Feminine, and Swimming, all debuted in the top five on the Billboard charts. And if all that wasn't enough, he'd also dated and released music with Ariana Grande, who instantly elevated Miller into a bona fide crossover superstar. But despite all the talent and popularity and the immense financial success that came with it, Mac Miller was in dire straits. Beginning in 2011, when he was just 19 years old, through much of the remainder of his life, Miller carried out an incredible drug habit. He snorted crushed up oxy pills as well as cocaine and angel dust. He smoked weed, dropped acid, and drank huge amounts of alcohol. During his Macadelic tour in 2012, Miller developed a lifelong addiction to lean, a concoction of soda mixed with codeine-based cough syrup and promethazine an ingredient in many allergy medications. The drink gives people who take it a euphoric high, but it can also cause heart attacks, seizures, and other maladies. During a short period of sobriety in 2014, Miller said that at the lowest point of his lean addiction, he turned his back on family and friends who tried to get him clean. I was lost, he said, but the sobriety didn't last long, and he soon started abusing narcotics almost every day. He spoke about his dependency in interviews with Rolling Stone and New York Magazine, saying he hated being an addict, but admitted that being sober was incredibly difficult for him. He later confessed he would probably, quote, never stop doing drugs because he enjoyed them so much. He came to believe he couldn't make the music without the drugs, and in return he made the drugs an integral part of his music. His 2014 album, Faces, opens with Miller pondering his own death, writing that he, quote, should have died already from all the drugs he'd taken, and closed with the song Grand Finale, which he said was, quote, supposed to be the last song I make on earth. The next year, he released what might have been his greatest song, Godspeed, which likewise focused on his drug use and his fear of an early death. White lines be numbing them dark times, the pills that I'm popping, I need a man up. And made it's a problem, I need to wake up. Before one morning, I don't wake up. You make your mistakes, your mistakes never make you. But Miller was physically strong and was somehow able to indulge his addictions with very few side effects for many years. But ultimately, it caught up with him. In early September 2018, just a month after Miller released his most acclaimed album, Swimming, Miller took what he believed were oxycodone pills he'd gotten from a dealer he knew, crushed them into a powder on the backside of an iPad lying on his bedroom floor, and snorted them along with a couple lines of cocaine. The pills, however, were counterfeit and laced with a lethal amount of fentanyl. Miller may have known something was wrong as he made his way off the floor and into bed. He sat forward on his knees facing the headboard and dropped his face into his lap in what the police would later call a prayer position. As he drifted off, the fentanyl overdose caused his respiratory drive in his brain to seize, which in turn caused his breathing to stop, and he passed away in his sleep. Mac Miller was 26 years old. I'm Jason Beckerman. I'm Derek Kaufman. This is Last Days, Mac Miller. Mac Miller's death triggered a year-long investigation into how he obtained the counterfeit pills. Charges were eventually brought against three people who prosecutors alleged were ultimately responsible for distributing the fentanyl that killed him. The court records from those prosecutions paint the most complete story of the last days of Mac Miller's life. And here's what we know. Around 11 p.m. on September 4th, 2018, Mac Miller texted his longtime dealer, a guy by the name of Cameron Pettit, asking if he could get him Adderall, Lean, and Percocet. Pettit was a low-level dealer who scratched out a living pushing oxy to junkies. He looked every part the street pusher he was, waif thin with pasty skin, and his hair often dyed Kool-Aid orange. He had a spiderweb tattoo on his head and another tattoo of the word oops stamped in the middle of his right cheek. 
Pettit quickly responded to Miller's request for drugs, saying he didn't have Adderall or lean, but offering to get other drugs for Miller. They ended the text exchange with Pettit agreeing to sell Miller 10 30 milligram oxycodone pills, which Pettit referred to as, quote, blues, as well as Xanax and a, quote, ball of cocaine. Pettit said he would deliver the drugs to Miller at 1 a.m. at the Conway Studios in Hollywood, where Miller was recording music for a new album. By all accounts, Miller was taking opioids and lean nearly every day at this point in his life. And on this night, he was desperate for a fix. Less than an hour after he texted Pettit at 12.55 a.m., five minutes before Pettit was due to arrive at the studio, Miller texted him asking where he was. Two minutes later, he texted again, and then again 11 minutes after that. Pettit didn't respond. Growing frantic, Miller texted one of Pettit's associates, a woman named Mia Johansson, who said she didn't know where Pettit was, but that she could supply him with what he needed. Johansson ultimately agreed to deliver Miller two types of opioids, as well as Xanax and two grams of cocaine. Miller agreed to pay $700 extra to have an adult worker named Carla Amador deliver the goods and stay with Miller for about an hour. A few minutes later, Pettit finally wrote back saying he'd gotten waylaid, but was on his way to the studio. Pettit and Amador arrived at the studio at about the same time, and Miller happily accepted all of the drugs from both sources. He then left for his home with Amador. What happened next is not entirely clear. Miller and possibly Amador consumed some of the drugs, and the couple had sex until daybreak. The additional four hours of Amador's time, Johansson insisted, would cost Miller another $2,400. Amador then left. 48 hours later, on the morning of September 7th, Miller's personal assistant, a young man named Sam, drove to Miller's house to check on him. Sam used his key to let himself in, and then walked into the bedroom, expecting to wake up a sleeping Miller. Instead, he found him on his knees in bed, unresponsive and blue with his back bent forward and his head on his knees. Sam tried to perform CPR and then called 911, but you can hear from the tone in his voice and the few words he spoke, he clearly knew Mac was already dead. What is the emergency? How can we help you? Okay. Are you there with him now? When's the last time you saw him or talked to him? Yesterday, please. Okay. Hurry. Stay with me on the line, okay? We're already on the way there now. I'm going to give you instructions. Is he a, can you wake him up? I'm going to give you instructions. Stay with me on the line, okay? You found him on the bed, on the floor? Listen, listen, so I can help you. The only way we're going to help your friend is if you follow my... Hello, sir? Derek, something struck me as I was listening to the 911 call. How many times in the year that we've been doing this podcast have we told such a similar story? The assistant, the person who works for the star, who discovers their deceased employer and that makes that agonizing call to 911. We saw it with Robin Williams, Amy Winehouse, Heath Ledger, Whitney Houston, most recently Matthew Perry. Yeah, it really highlights the extraordinary privilege that people in Hollywood with immense means have. They have these people who tend to them, but it also highlights something else to me, that the, the life is sort of desperately lonely. These are not often family members who are discovering you. Exactly. These are not spouses. These are not their parents. You'll hear these assistants get on the phone calls, and they're the most intimately involved with these celebrities' lives because they tend to them every day, sometimes 24-7. So they're not quite enablers. They're not giving them the drugs, but they're making the lifestyle possible. I think there's a tremendous amount of guilt, unfairly, that, that people who find the individuals put on themselves. Could I have done more? Should I have been there for them? It's clear that this individual, it's almost certain that they knew that Mac Miller had a tremendous drug habit. It's not their responsibility, certainly, to clean them up. But nevertheless, when you see somebody descending and then you find them dead and you have to make that agonizing call to 911, the trauma that these assistants feel. I mean, we saw it with Heath Ledger. This was a, in Heath Ledger's case, it was a masseuse, I believe, who yes. came to, to, to somebody who came to him regularly. And she finds the body and then she's got to be the one that puts everything into action. It's an unfair ask, but it's a situation. It's unimaginable. And these people are often quite young. You do yes, these kind of jobs right. when you're young in your 20s and you have a lot of energy and you're willing to take pay that isn't sort of great. Right. Um, and so to be traumatized in these ways, to discover the person that you work for in this state must be absolutely overwhelming. Absolutely overwhelming. Yeah. So paramedics arrived at Miller's house just before noon, followed soon thereafter by the L.A. County Medical Examiner's team, which quickly set out to piece together what exactly happened. They found an empty bottle of alcohol on the nightstand, as well as remnants of cocaine, Xanax, oxycodone, hydrocodone, and generic Adderall. But most significantly, they found six circular blue pills in the pocket of Miller's jacket hung on the back of a bedroom door. The pills were imprinted with a V on one side and the numbers 48-12 on the other. And that's a designation for a brand of opioids known as oxycodone hydrochloride. 
Tests on the pills revealed, however, that they were high-quality counterfeits comprised primarily of fentanyl made to look like the real thing. At about the same time as the pills were discovered to contain fentanyl, the coroner likewise determined that it was also fentanyl which had killed Mac Miller. Thus, having answered the why and the how of Miller's death, investigators now turned their attention to figuring out who was responsible. And it didn't take long. Investigators got a court order allowing them to access Miller's text messages, which quickly led them to Pettit. Those messages, as you'll recall, included Pettit's reference to the, quote, 10 blues he would deliver to Miller, a clear reference to the blue pills they found in Miller's coat pocket. And investigators now knew they had their man. But they also knew that Pettit was a low-level dealer, and they wanted to climb the chain of command. So they subpoenaed Pettit's phone records and learned that his source for the counterfeit blue opioids was a 46-year-old man named Stephen Walter. Now, Walter was well-known to authorities. He had previously been arrested a number of times for dealing, and cops had long suspected him as being a distributor of counterfeit fentanyl-laced opioids. Cops also learned from Pettit's text messages that Walter had used a, quote, mule named Ryan Revis to deliver the deadly pills to Pettit that night. Pettit, Walter, and Revis were all very well aware that they were the ones that had distributed the drugs that killed Mac Miller. In fact, the same night Miller died, Pettit texted a friend expressing fear he would be blamed for Miller's death, saying he might flee the country to avoid spending years in prison. Revis, the mule, wrote to Walter, the supplier, saying they were running a huge risk trafficking in the counterfeit meds in the wake of Mac's death. He wrote, quote, People have been dying from taking blues left and right. You better believe law enforcement is using informants and undercovers to buy them on the street so they can start putting people in prison for life for selling fake pills. But this didn't stop any of the men from continuing to sell. Indeed, the U.S. Attorney's Office prosecuting the case was able to establish that over the next year, as prosecutors were quietly building their case against Pettit, Reeves, and Walter, the three men allegedly continued to traffic in opioids, many of them likely counterfeit. And so, on September 4, 2019, exactly one year to the day after Mac Miller sent the fateful text message to Cameron Pettit asking for drugs, police raided their homes and arrested all three men. Each was charged with conspiracy to sell a controlled substance that resulted in death. Mac Miller's father, at a gathering in Mac's hometown of Pittsburgh intending to commemorate the one-year anniversary of his son's death, announced the arrest to dozens of family members and friends. So they finally caught the mother that sold him the drugs. To kill. And, and we find some comfort in that. And many of us were young, including me, experimenting with drugs. But it's a different world out there. And all it takes is a little stone, a little tiny stone of fentanyl and cocaine, and you're dead. Drugs are being laced with fentanyl, all kinds of drugs. And the one thing I would say to you is don't take the risk. It's just not worth it. It's just not worth it. There's so much there, Derek. It, it, there's a lot of emotions to unpack. This Both his bomb. emotions, you could hear people crying in the background commemorating his death after a year. Well, it starts with you hear this elation. Yes. I mean, they're, 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 they're treating it as sort of discovering the murderer, right? Because they wanted someone brought to justice for giving Mac Miller pills that ended up killing him. I mean, this this was a guy who was uh, a heavy drug user um, yeah. and, and happened to get this bad batch, and that's what took his life. So you can understand that on one level, they wanted to apprehend and put away the guys who are, who are distributing counterfeit pills that are killing people. In another way, though, they're sort of completely absolving the behavior itself. They're, they're minimizing him. And I understand as a, as a father, I, w- I would do the same thing, right? We, we, we're willing to make every excuse we can on behalf of our kids. But it, and, and there's plenty of blame to go around. These three dudes are bad people, and they're knowingly distributing counterfeit pills that can kill people. And that, for that, they deserve the punishment we'll talk about in a minute, the punishment they're going to get. But at the same time, you can't absolve Mac of, of wrongdoing, right? He, this was a This was a seven-year habit that he had. Addiction's a terrible thing, though. Right? Yeah, there were just a lot of reps. When you're a drug user, you're constantly getting your fix, and the odds of getting a bad batch in today's world increase every time you roll the dice right. and call your drug right. dealer that you're going to get some bad pills. So there was a behavioral element. I, you know, I sympathize a lot with Mac Miller and people like him because drug addiction's a real disease. You know, yeah. I have it in my family, um, and so I'm aware that he didn't have 
control over this behavior in, in the sense that we often think about it. But his father is also sort of saying like, you know, I used to do some drugs and yeah. everyone does drugs. So we should make them. He's sort of intimating that they should be safer out there. But then he, may, but he makes the right point. It's a cautionary tale at the end. Right. Yeah. It's different today. He could do coke and you there's always or whatever he did back in the back in the day, his father. And you, there were risks of it, but now with the with the fentanyl flooding the market, the fake pills, it's just he, to his point, it's too much. Use my son as a cautionary tale. Yeah, it's it's heart wrenching stuff. I mean, this was already really in the wake is. of Prince having passed away from yeah. a similar similar incident. The charges prosecutors leveled at the three men: conspiracy to distribute a controlled substance that led to death, carried a maximum sentence of twenty years in federal prison. In announcing the charges, the U.S. attorney said that it would seek the maximum for each of the three defendants, noting with particular contempt that they continued to sell narcotics after Miller's death with full knowledge of the risks their products pose to human life. And Jason, that is the part that really takes away all sympathy for the yeah. drug dealers. I sometimes think, you know, drug dealers are dealing because they have to make a living and they don't want to harm anyone. But to have the knowledge and then continue distributing those pills that that harmed somebody... That's where you just hey, lose everything. I, I you mean, lose everything. To, to say it's unforgivable is is just an understatement. There's not even a point to be made here. These are three people that need to go to jail for a long time because they, if not, they will kill other people. That's right. Yeah. So three years later, in September 2022, both Stephen Walter and Ryan Revis pled guilty to one count of distribution of fentanyl. Walter was sentenced to 17 and a half years in federal prison and Revis to 11 years. Revis, remember, was just the mule. I mean, not that it absolves him, but he but was- somewhat less culpability. Ex right, Exactly. Cameron Pettit remains in federal prison in Los Angeles awaiting trial, but no date has been set yet. Now, I wanted to shift here into the counterfactual. We don't do this in every episode because people die at different stages of their life. But Mac Miller was 26 years old. He really was at the beginning of life, and he was just starting to emerge as this huge star. You talk to people in our office about big celebrity deaths. I mean, for our generation, we think of, you know, John Lennon. We think of Michael Jackson's death. We think of Prince's death. To uh, the generations behind us, Mac Miller was really a big, big deal. He really was. And the, so, so Mac Miller's career is interesting. He starts out, he's just releasing mixtapes on the streets like so many young artists do, especially in the rap community do. He starts getting notoriety, starts to get famous, dates Ariana Grande, releases a song, is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. But his music is developing. There's a lot of, uh, of ink spilled about his career and how early on he just did what they call fret rap, which is not very well thought of in the rap community. By the end of his career with the album Swimming, he's now become a full-fledged artist and really well-respected in the highest circles, Drake's comment about him in particular. Yeah, he hustled and he worked at the craft he did, and, and he got he a lot better. getting really good. The other aspect is that the autopsy report that came back after his death painted the picture of a really healthy man. I mean, you know, everybody reacts differently. Every human, human being is different. Some people really sort of their bodies really turn on them when they use drugs. Not Mac Miller's, but for the fentanyl. He was doing just fine. This is the ultimate tragedy to me. He was in perfect health but for that night. I mean, yes, yes he was a heavy drug user, and over time that would have taken its toll, right. but he was so young. This is not a situation where we watched Amy Winehouse was also young, but she really presented right. as someone who was falling Heath Ledger, apart. Heath same Ledger. Way. Right. Those They were young, um, but they also were showing signs of wear. But, that but wasn't the, the case with The autopsy Miller. said a circulatory system, respiratory system, GI system, heart, kidneys, lungs, all in perfect order. There was no sign of the seven years of hardcore drug use that he had been uh, engaging in. And so the, to the counterfactual, if Mac Miller doesn't get this laced uh, pill that night, pills that night. He'd be a big time artist right He'd now. be a big time, he'd be alive. He'd be a big time artist, profound drug user, most likely. Yeah. He didn't seem to be uh, on the road to sobriety. But it, it's it, the the tragedy. I mean, just the there's tragedy almost is no the doubt. loss of life, but it's exacerbated by the loss of a great career. Yeah, to your point, some drug users, uh, you know, habitual drug users, do survive and make lots of music. Keith we've Richards. Talked, we've talked about this <laughs> yeah. before. Keith Richards, and so he yeah. could have been on that path where he managed it in his life if it, if it wasn't taken by fentanyl. So, in the wake of Mac Miller's death, there was an overwhelming outpouring of love for the fallen star. Chance, the rapper who toured with Mac when they were both just starting out thanked him for helping to launch his career and called him, quote, one of the sweetest guys I ever knew. Another close friend, the rapper g Easy, who has likewise raged his own battles with drugs, thanked Miller for being there for him during his hardest times. He went on to say, I can't believe this is real. Please tell your friends and the people you care about that you love them. Life is so fucking fragile. You will be missed and your music will live on forever through the millions of people you touched. Thank you for all you gave us. But most poignant of all were the comments of Ariana Grande, Mac's ex-girlfriend, who is perhaps the person most responsible for his enormous commercial success at such a young age. She expressed absolute devastation at the loss and the pointlessness of how he died. But she also conveyed anger and disappointment at both Mac and herself 
for not being able to fix him. She wrote, quote, I adored you from the day I met you, when I was 19, and I always will. I can't believe you aren't here anymore. I really can't wrap my head around it. We talked about this so many times. I'm so mad. I'm so sad. I don't know what to do. You were my dearest friend for so long, above anything else. I'm so sorry I couldn't fix or take the pain away. I really wanted to. The kindest, sweetest soul with demons he never deserved. I hope you're okay now. Rest. Everybody's saying I need rehab, so I'm speeding with a blindfold on and won't be long until they're watching me crash. And they don't want to see that. They don't want me to OD and have to talk to my mother, tell her they could have done more to help me, or she'd be crying, saying that she'd do anything to have me back.